Well, uh, welcome to the first day of the uh, 43rd Annual Legislative Conference brought to you by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. My name is Marjorie Innocent, and I'm the Vice President for Research and Programs at the Foundation. My primary background is actually in health and social policy, but for anybody who gets that, because it's like, well, that sounds like a lot of words. Um, I'm one of those people who's actually very interested in the interface of health and other areas of life. Um, I'm also someone who is very committed to and has a lot of experience in youth development. So issues around um, education, um, self-efficacy, development for young people, as well as their health, of course, is something that's really, really in, of, of great interest uh, to me. And so I'm especially excited to be able to be here with you today and to bring to you this very, very important discussion around STEM education, which of course we have entitled Beacons for the Future, Trailblazers in STEM Education for African Americans. As you know, um, education in uh, sciences, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, continue to be a growing area of interest in our country, particularly as a lot of advancements are really helping to generate a lot of um, progress, right, in how people live their lives, in uh, medical practice, in the development of energy, and in so many other areas. So we're really seeing what you can, for all intents and purposes, call a real explosion of research advancements as well as career opportunities that are making STEM jobs uh, of greater interest and quite frankly more and more uh, lucrative and necessary. However, we have to recognize that preparing for careers in STEM absolutely requires a lot of preparation, right? Um, and training, as it does in other fields. Indeed, though, there are a number of challenges to our current educational system um, and to our educational environment that really do limit opportunities for many, particularly African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, and other populations that are underrepresented in STEM fields from them to really be able to take on these opportunities and really help to contribute to greater social advancement. That said, there is hope. There are a number of programs that have successfully expanded learning, training, and mentoring opportunities for young people around STEM, and uh, particularly for underrepresented groups through both school-based and out-of-school opportunities. And you're going to hear about some of these today, just a few, but some very, very important ones. We're also going to learn more about what's happening at the federal policy level to advance STEM education, particularly for African-American children, youth, and young adults. Um, I have to admit, we were also going to have participation from a, a local area, a very, very important local area representative, County Executive Rashern Baker from uh, Prince George's County was supposed to join us also today. Unfortunately, because of a schedule mishap, um, he won't be able to be here, but he certainly regrets uh, not being able to join us, and I'm, I'm sure he's certainly with us um, in spirit. So I did want to mention that to you. So to actually start off our discussion today, I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you our moderator uh, for today, Ms. Jillian Johnson. Jillian is one of our 2012-2014 uh, CBCF Congressional Fellows, and her focus area is actually around education, appropriately enough. And she's currently working on the uh, Senate Subcommittee on Children and Families under the leadership of Senator Kay Hagan. Her primary work is actually on education and healthcare policy, especially as it relates to ensuring greater access, equity, and quality for underserved communities. Jillian has already been the recipient of several awards, and she earned her Master's of Education in Higher Education and Student Affairs Administration from the University of Vermont. Please welcome Jillian Johnson. So good, af good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Just a little more enthusiasm. I know it's dim, but good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're excited about education. We're excited about STEM. Um, so I want to welcome you all to this exciting and informative discussion. Um, I'm honored to serve as your moderator um, for this much needed and timely conversation. When it comes to exposing youth to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, known as STEM, we know the earlier the better. Students of color and women are sorely underrepresented in STEM careers. Many times it's due to a lack of early access to related programs and exposure to professionals. Having worked in higher education, I've been able to hear from students about their experiences in STEM while at post-secondary institutions. Often they admit that the classes are difficult and rigorous, um, and it oftentimes entails a lot of studying, 
But one of the other things that I've heard black males specifically talk about is a feeling of isolation that they feel in the classroom because oftentimes they might be the only one or one of a few. Additionally, at the same time, something else that starts to creep up on them is also this low, this feeling of low self-efficacy in terms of their academic abilities to persist in the major, thus hampering their ability to be and feel successful. We all know that confidence matters in life and having a strong self-concept better equips students to navigate through life's most difficult challenges. As a community, we are here today to address these issues and challenges, but also we're also here to highlight some of the wonderful policies, initiatives, and programs that are happening in our country today. And we will hear about that from the local, state, and federal levels. Because we want to begin to change the narrative. So it's always this negative narrative about black males being low achieving, Hispanic, Latino males being low achieving, not having women in the field. Um, but we want to start to begin to change that narrative. And it's important for us to know about the great works that these folks are doing here to do that. Um, and I also want to, I will briefly introduce the panel. Um, you should find, you should have their bios or have access to their bios. So I'm not going to go in depth, um, but I'm going to briefly give a little background about each of them. And if each panelist will just raise their hand so people will be able to identify you because they're not sitting in the order that I'm going to introduce them. So the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Lynn Holden. She's a native of Philadelphia um, and she completed her undergraduate studies at Howard University and, me and medical education at Temple University School of Medicine. In March 2006, Dr. Holden co-founded the national nonprofit Mentoring in Medicine, Inc. The mission of MEM is to increase in the diversity of the healthcare workforce Sorry. by providing academic enrichment, leadership development, civic engagement, and mentoring to socioeconomically disadvantaged students interested in pursuing a biomedical career. She also currently serves as the Secretary of, of the Empire State Medical Association of the National Medical Association and serves on the Board of Directors of the Friends of the National Library of Medicine. I next would like to introduce Dr. Faye Payton. She is the Director and Founder of My Health Impact Network, a social network experience that focuses on health disparities and social media technology interventions. She earned a PhD in Information and Decisions Decision Systems with a specialty in healthcare systems from Case Western Reserve University, my home state of Ohio. <laughs> Dr. Payton's research in interests include healthcare, information, and disparities, social media uses among the millennial and underrepresented groups, racial and ethnic identities in online communities, broadening participation in ICT and STEM education and workforce participation and the influence of race, class, and gender identities on health information seeking and content creation. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Reagan Flowers. She began her education career as a high school teacher at Jack Yates High School, which was her first firsthand experience seeing some of the academic achievement gaps that we are all well aware of that are happening in our classroom today. In 2002, Dr. Flowers founded CSTEM, Communication, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, Teacher and Student Support Services, Inc., which is the first integrated pre-K through 12th grade STEM enrichment program in the nation. Since founding CSTEM, the organization has grown from 20 students to nearly 60,000. 20 students to nearly 60,000. And, it, and this revenue over the years has grown from 5,000 to over 5 million. So you can tell she's been doing a lot of work and her team has been working very hard. Um, so it'd be great to hear from her. She also holds a PhD from, from the Union Institute and University and received her BS and MA from Texas Southern University. Also to my left, I have Carla Arbina. Um, she's a seasoned me media and communications professional with extensive experience in social and educational issues in the general in the general and the Hispanic markets. She proudly serves the Virginia and Washington DC community as a director of school engagement for Project Lead the Way. And then to the far left, 
the only male on the panel today who is going to hold it down for us, <laughs> representing the male. <laughs> we have um, David Johns, and he is the executive director of the White House Initiative of on edu Educational Excellence for African Americans. This initiative will work across federal agencies and with partners and communities nationwide to provide a more effective continuum of education programs for African American students. Johns has worked on issues affecting low income and minority students, neglected youth and early childhood education, and with historically black colleges and universities. He also has a master's degree in sociology and education policy from Teachers College, Columbia University, where he graduated summa cum laude while simultaneously teaching elementary school in New York City. And our last panelist today is, also, is Paulette Lewis. Um, she serves as the regional administrator of the Women's Bureau from the U.S. Department of Labor for Regions 4 and 6, with her responsibilities including promoting policies leading to better jobs, working conditions, and salaries for working women in the eight southern, southern eastern and southwestern states. She began her career in Atlanta in 1972 as a co-founder of the Minority Women Employment Program, which operated in 10 cities to place minority women in engagement in management, technical, and professional jobs. She has been recognized locally and nationally for her work and advocacy on behalf of women and girls in small business. But now I'm gonna move on to the portion where we're gonna highlight some of the different programs, and we're gonna move on to um, Lynn with, hold, with mentoring in medicine. Pardon the very brief interruption. As Dr. Holden comes up, I do want to mention to you all, we have historically had a program for the Future Focus series, of which this session is a, is a piece, a component. Um, in the past, we've had a program where we actually had bios of the speakers that we thought could be a very useful resource. We do have it this year. However, I'm a little shaky about this still, but we're going green, so it is fully electronic. And just so you know, there is an app, in case you hadn't heard yet, that is available on all Apple products as well as Droid products, ALC2013, all right? So if you look up on your, um, under your apps for ALC2013, you will be able to get the app and actually be able to uh, get information about most of the sessions. If you look under schedule, for uh, folks who have Droids, I believe it's available now for um, Apple, we're just waiting for clearance for them to post it you will actually be able to see the Future Focus journal that will actually have um, complete information on the sessions, including the bios of the speakers. So just keep that in mind. Thank you, Dr. Holden. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here to share with you some of the work that's being done throughout the country uh, with many organizations. And I get to start off with mentoring in medicine. Diabetes. Here's a little something I wrote for you. When it comes to diabetes, there's type one and type two. Don't be ashamed if you're a diabetic. Type one diabetes is often genetic. On the other hand, if you're a type two diabetic, your eating habits are most likely pathetic. A little sugar is good now and then, as long as your body can produce insulin. If you don't have diabetes, don't start a riot. If you have diabetes, don't start a riot. It's easily curtailed with a healthy diet. Diabetes isn't rare to a civilian. In fact, it affects over 25 million. To avoid type two, this is what I advise, eat healthy and get lots of exercise. In some cases, you, not much can be done. Type one diabetes you get when you're young. There is a lot of research going on, but no cure yet. For now, take your meds and don't fret. I don't want to keep you so long, so I'll come to a close. These are just some facts that nobody knows. And this is by a 10th grader in our program. Uh, one of our programs. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lynn Holden. I am an associate professor, as you can see, of emergency medicine. I actually practice emergency medicine. Uh, uh, have a couple shifts this week. Um, I call that my job, taking care of patients in the emergency department. I call my calling, uh, mentoring in medicine, an organization I co-founded with uh, two, uh, two African-American uh, two minority physicians um, who are also in emergency medicine. Uh, so mentoring in medicine is what I will talk to you today about with some challenges and some updates. Okay, okay the objectives in my uh, brief talk are first of all to define STEM and uh, we know it as science, technology, engineering, and math. I like to add the second M, medicine. 
uh, and the crisis that's going on in these fields. To introduce the work of mentoring in medicine very briefly, and then to describe some challenges for the future. As you can see, uh, there is a crisis going on in medicine. Currently, about 6% of the practicing physicians are either African American or Latino. This data is from the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, and you see here that of all the applicants, almost 45,000 applicants total, that less than 3,000 were African American. Of those, 1,400 females and 870 males. So as you can see, we're taking up a very small part of the applicant pool for medical school. What's even more alarming are the number of students who are accepted and actually attend medical school. If you look at the zero, that's actually the American Indian and Alaskan Natives. They haven't even really come up at all since uh, between 2009 and 2012, which reflects this chart. I practice emergency medicine, and generally we do not like straight lines or flat lines. We try to avoid that. So uh, as you can see here, if you look at the red line, that's actually how many African Americans have matriculated or attended medical school from 2009 to 2012. We're not talking about the obstacles they have after they get out of medical school uh, with testing, job, finding a job, a residency position, a training position, but these are the numbers. Sadly enough, in over 100 and in 141 United States medical schools, in 2012, less than 480 black males were in those medical schools out of 19,500 <coughs> students total. Less than 500 black males out of almost 20,000 students total. So this indeed is a crisis for our society. Mentoring in Medicine was uh, founded in 2006. Our goals are really twofold. First of all, to be the feet on the street, to find students who are low income and disadvantaged, to not only find them, but to groom them for careers in science and health. Our second goal is to make sure that they graduate from health professional and graduate schools. And lastly, to increase the health literacy in disadvantaged communities. Our services include not only programs, which I'll explain in a few minutes, that we perform, but also consulting to different organizations, and also professional development for teachers, for parents, uh, and also health professionals that join our group. Then I'll talk a little bit about our results. This is a busy slide, but it basically shows all of our programming in a nutshell. We work with students from elementary school through college. We have community-based programs, a conference, a hip-hop stage play, which is actually now touring in Detroit, and also a virtual summer science camp. Our school-based programs include not only an after-school program for both middle school students and high school students, but also an in-class program for those students who are really uh, interested and driven to uh, pursue a career in medicine. With the college students, where we started with college students in 2002, however, we realized that these students had large deficits not only in reading, not only in math, but also in communications, in social etiquette, in emotional intelligence. So that's why we decided to uh, start programs younger in the pipeline. Those students not only go through intensive preparation for medical school, which includes working with the learning specialist, a drama coach, motivational coach, a mental performance coach, both live and virtually, but also uh, doing community service and shadowing uh, in a very busy emergency department, the one I work in, which has over 100,000 adult visits uh, per year. We recruit uh, biomedical volunteers. We train them. Currently, we have almost 1,000 across the country uh, who work with us. Our programs include, again, uh, the I want to focus on the, the school-based programs because I think that those programs are where we're making a real impact. The school-based programs include, again, the after-school and in-class programs. We found that, um, as a result, 97% of the students who participated, and uh, so far we've had about 1,200 students who have participated in New York. Uh, we also have programming in Detroit and D.C. 
97% had an increase in the knowledge, the content, uh, that content being not only about uh, scientific inquiry, but also about body systems, about um, communication, et cetera. What's interesting is that 40% of the students had lower GPAs in their school, but higher scores in mentoring and medicine. 85% experienced an increase in confidence or self-efficacy, which Dr. Innocent referred to uh, a few minutes ago. 60% had improved attendance at their school. 100% increased research in healthcare topics, and 95% engaged their community, whether it be their friends, their church, their family, about healthy living. In our college-based programs, uh, we have uh, roughly, we've studied about 500 students, um, and that is in process. 98% were involved in science or health. Uh, we have 16 that have actually finished uh, residency or in residency, eight of them in emergency medicine, yay! Uh, <laughs> and we have about 115 who are currently in medical school. That's 72% of those who applied uh, have, are now in medical school. And we have about another uh, 56 who are in PA school, nursing school, masters, for example, in biomedical engineering. So we're really trying to help these students from a young age to groom them, to stick with them, and to serve not only as a clearinghouse for partners, but also having our primary, um, our primary programs. And we refer to these children as uh, the mentoring and medicine family, to let them know that there's a group of like-minded students, there's a group of like-minded educators who want to help them. Uh, as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. Some of the brief lessons learned are that hands-on activities and trips keep the students engaged, uh, again encouraging interaction, interaction between like-minded students, making them feel special, having role models uh, that reflect them so that they can see that success is possible, and also researching and uh, creating uh, community health ambassador uh, projects so that they can serve as the teacher in their community and talk more about healthcare issues. So some of the challenges that I see moving forward are, first of all, the school systems, and many of them, especially in New York City, big urban areas like that, are under-resourced. Uh, and that provides us with uh, students in the pipeline who are not prepared for the rigor of medical school, of sciences, um, really of any advanced work when they get to college. The second uh, challenge that I see is, is collaboration. Many programs operate in silo. Uh, we need to partner, we need to take advantage of the assets and the lessons learned from, from all of the programs so that we can then, uh, we can then propel more students forward uh, into the STEM careers, STEM squared careers. And lastly, sustainability. Uh, unless we have a fairy godfather or get fairy godmother, uh, funding uh, can be an issue um, in sustaining programs that are very successful uh, for the years to come. I just want to close briefly with uh, another work from, from another student. This is an 11th grader, uh, Stroke, it's called. My teacher said in order for me to pass, I had to write a rhyme for anatomy class. Nothing too long, not too quick, just to make sure you stick to the rubric. The topic I chose is not a joke. I'm going to talk to you about stroke. Having a stroke is really tragic, but which type did you have, ischemic or hemorrhagic? If you don't know, let me explain. Strokes occur within the brain. Ischemic strokes happen a lot. They occur when the blood vessel has a clot. You may think I say that just to rhyme, but ischemic strokes happen 87% of the time. I should have talked about hemorrhagic first. This type occurs when a blood vessel bursts. When am I having a stroke? How do I know? Do your limbs feel numb? Are you talking really slow? Has your face drooped or your vision blurred? A stroke might just have occurred. A stroke is not a pleasant event, so here are some steps to prevent. Watch your diet, don't stress, and exercise. These are just some words to the wise. Don't think you're safe because you're young. A stroke can happen to anyone. I hope you enjoyed. My rhyme is complete. Now I'm going to take my seat. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That was a little better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am Faye Cobb Payton, 
And today what I'd like to talk to you about is actually a project that I'm running with the National Science Foundation. Okay, so let's talk about in the numbers. So just to give you a little background about myself, I actually did not come out of a medical school. In fact, when I was in high school, I actually went and attended a magnet school intended for students that had the goal of becoming MDs. And for me at that time, what was critical was that in my high school, we actually had clinical rotations. And I saw live birth at 16. I saw physical therapy on army vets at 16. I saw cystic fibrosis children at 16. And at 16, I decided in 11th grade, I don't want to be a medical doctor. <laughs> and, and I think it, it's, it's really important that we tell young people, sometimes it's important, more important for you to know what you don't want to do than it is to know what you want to do. So for me, I, I clearly understood at that point, I did need the rigor of the magnet school in order to do something that I wanted to do. So I became an engineer, so all of the math and the science really helped me out. So, but let's talk about what, what that means in the numbers. So I'm coming from this from a technology perspective. And so if you take a look at uh, statistics from the U.S. Bureau of Labor uh, in, t in terms of employment projections, now, I'm in the area of computer information systems. Some people lump computer science into that. Some put information systems into that area. But I like to call it all computing. So if you look at the pie, the big piece of the pie in STEM will be in computing. So let's think about that in terms of your everyday life. A lot of people have droids. A lot of people have Apple. You're on the web. You have your frequent flyer programs, you have your awards programs, you have your store cards. I can even mine your data and tell you what books, what apps, what programs you've used. That's all computing, right? What you see on the web in terms of development, what you see in terms of the content, that's all computing. So if you look at the pie, almost three quarters of the pie says that a lot of the career opportunities or jobs, which is not a word that I use in the classroom, a job, will be in computing, okay? So let's keep that in mind. But when we take a step back, getting into STEM fields, as was said earlier, really does require some challenge, some things to happen, and now I put my parent hat on and say, long before students get to high school. In fact, I even say by second grade, okay? Because I'm in a state where, which says that by third grade, students are tracked by reading scores as to whether prisons will be built, mm -hmm. okay? So they're also tracked to say whether they will be on an academically gifted track versus a regular track. And that tracking really makes a difference when you're talking about that 71% in computing, okay? So this is where we rank in terms of science and mathematics when we look at the world. And this is a slide that I actually use with young people. You know, I'm often asked to come out and do these career sessions for young people, and the first thing they say is, how much money do you make? Mm -hmm. That's what young people want to know. And you know, sometimes we have to meet young people where they are. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to me. So I say, okay, I'm not gonna tell you what I make, but I'm gonna tell you what I did in order to get what I make, okay? So I give them the statistics. And this is, the, this is something that really intrigues them when they say, wow, I can, you know, I can get $638 a week you know, if I graduate from high school, then I give them a little exercise and say, well, you got to live somewhere, you've got to eat, you need transportation, and everybody has to have their little mobile device, <laughs> all right? So somehow that $638 a week 
you fall short, okay? And so hopefully this is part of the motivation for them to look at education in terms of levels and in perhaps earning potential. Then I sort of give it to them if they don't like the bars, some people don't like the bars, I give them the line, okay? So I give it to them in two ways and sort of say, okay, over a time period of your age, by the time you get 40, because they always say, well, how old are you? I said, well, somewhere in my 40s. Because they said, wow, that's old. <laughs> said, okay, I'm old, okay, I'll take that. But let's talk about being old and being able to have earning potential, mm -hmm. being able to build wealth. So for me, a large part of the work that I do in the project that I'm working on is all about finding the hook. Okay, and so you know the hook, right? I gave you two examples here. The Alicia Keys, Jay-Z, the Empire State of Mind. It's New York, concrete jungles, where dreams are made of. That captures the young people's attention. You may not like it, whatever your age group may be, but you've got to capture their attention, okay? For those of us from back in the day from Run DMC, <laughs> you know, walk this way. <laughs> You know, so the hook is really important. So to give you an idea of what is important to me is social media. Now, if you had asked me about this four years ago, was social media important to me? I'd say no, okay? I'd say no. But being in computing, I took a look at the numbers and here's some stats about how data is flowing. And remember that data, that's all computing all computing. Here's the data going across the content on Facebook weekly. Okay, numbers probably deflated by now. 13 hours of YouTube video uploaded every minute. YouTube. Okay, how many views you get on YouTube per day? In the numbers. And tweets Everybody's tweeting now, even up here on the panel, right? <laughs> Are you tweeting? Okay. So social media lives large. And so what I had to find as my hook for this project was meeting young people where they are. So here's my story and how I actually got to this experience. So I'm a professor at North Carolina State University. I teach computer information systems. I do all of the database programming, the analytics. I do some systems development and design work. And I had this African-American student come to my office one day. And she's young, and she is about to embark on her career. She's an excellent student, and she comes to me, and I'm thinking she wants to talk about negotiations of the, of the job offer. So I had to say, sit down, and she, she begins to weep. And I said, wow, what's, you know, what's going on? She said, I want to talk to you, Dr. Payton, because I found out today that my boyfriend exposed me to HIV. I didn't know he was HIV positive. Completely changed her life. Completely changed her life. She did not want to. Um, she did not want to go to the campus um, health center because she didn't want to be stigmatized, and that was a turning point for me because I had done healthcare research and designing systems, but I wasn't trained on how to deal with that issue at that moment. So I embarked on this effort, taking a look at how technology can be used to address issues of health and health disparity, as opposed to how you can use technology to make healthcare delivery more efficient. And, and I hope in the audience you understand what I mean by there's a profit motive versus a care motive. So that really shifted what my focus would be. But the Department of Health and Human Services puts out its report and says social media 
is how we can actually tap a large part of the population. And if you take a look at Nielsen, and I'm not going to read all of this, it is a very busy slide, but I just want to point out one thing in the corner where it says black women play a very critical role in influencing their communities. And at the bottom, Nielsen also puts out and says, you know, 72% of black adults are online using one form of social media. And black women are likely to be 70 times, 72% more likely to post a blog, read a blog, read some content, share a story. So I said, okay, how can I engage the students to address this issue around health, particularly HIV and AIDS? What would resonate from them? I can't play this video, but what I can share with you is that when 60 Minutes aired this piece, it talks about the millennials and how they work, how they live, and how they play, and how they are changing the game on how we work, live, and play. Young people, we have millennials in here now that will shape and change the way we do things. And it's a very interesting video. I said, okay, there's more to be said there. We take a look. The International Conference on AIDS, HIV, said, you know, social media is the way to go. Tweeting happens each day. The Health and Human Services Department says Web 2.0 will be of use. And so I sought out to form a team, a team of students. It was not easy. I know we will talk about challenges. It was not easy securing the funding to engage college students, black college students, to talk about health and health disparities, particularly around stigmatized diseases like HIV. That was, that, that's hard work. Um, but I said, we're gonna, we're gonna try and, and we're gonna do this. So what I did was I formed a team, I, and I actually have college students on my team. So our first meeting goes something like this. You know, you go through the university, you have this great IRB process, and you have to say, okay, well, where are we going to put the flyers on campus to let people know to engage in focus groups and have discussions? And they said, flyers. <laughs> and I said, oh, boy, here we go. I said, flyers? I said, yes, I see the flyers all the time on campus on the billboard. So where should we put the flyers? They said, we don't read that stuff. That is not what we do. We use our social networks. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, let's use your social networks, <laughs> okay? So I think one of the lessons to take away is we can learn from young people. And if I had not adapted in that process, I'd still be putting up flyers, <laughs> trying to reach the target population. So if you go to My Health Impact on Twitter, that's our Twitter handle. It's My Health Impact. This is a screenshot of the website. The website is myhealthimpactnetwork.org. Everything that you see on the site takes the echoes of a for student by student model. Everything that's from design to the programming behind the scenes, to the creation of the infographics, to the video content, to even the app. So if you have a droid, we have an app. Give me some time. I'm working on a student that can help me with the iOS app. But everything that you see is for students to take ownership of content. That's very different than being a student that's taking ownership by using someone else's content. So they're shaping the message, okay? So this is just a screenshot um, to tell you. This is, uh, we, we blog, we are on Tumblr. They said, oh, you gotta move to Tumblr. Okay, we'll move to Tumblr. But what's gonna be the strategy? We have the Twitter feed that you can see there. I hope some of you have begun to follow us right now. Um, but the large part of this is, and I'm going to wrap it up because I think we only have 10 minutes, 
The large part of this is that using technical skills in computing to impact the community is really what this is all about. The second part of what this really is all about is I am working my way out of a job. And most people would be really fearful of that. My goal is to mentor the students so that they take my place. Let me give you the stats on the percentages of professors. You got the percentages on the students. If you think the student demographics are bad in STEM, check out the faculty representation. Okay? In computing, 3% or less African American. 3% or less. And a large number of the students that work with me have said, I've never seen someone that looks like me at this PWI. So it's hard to be what you cannot see, but it's not impossible. So my goal is to mentor them, and I'll talk about some other challenges and things um, afterwards. A number of them, some have gone away, gone to law school, some are in medical school. Um, some have gone on to uh, health professions fellowships. Um, one gentleman has accepted a job at Google, but he's not in Mountain View. He is now working with Google on its initiative to train high school students in programming skills in rural parts of the country. I'm so proud of him. Can you imagine? You know, when he could be in California, he's in rural South Carolina, training students how to program in Java, how to use Lego robotics and programming. So some have gone on to master's degrees, but we'll talk a little further. Um, one last thing, could you please pass me those, um, the, the purple t-shirts? I want to share this with you. So I've taken the students to research conferences. They couldn't come this week because they had exams. But a number of the students have gone on to research conferences and you know, one of the things they said to me is, you know, Dr. Payton, we like t-shirts. I said, okay, design a t-shirt. This is the t-shirt. This is all student driven. This is the design, this is the logo. And this is what they say, we have to have some swag about ourselves. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm gonna have swag too. I'll get a t-shirt. So, um, anyway, that's just it, and I'll turn it over to the next person. As Dr. Flowers makes her way, I just realized, my bad completely, forgot to mention, there actually is a, I know Dave is gonna be especially happy, a Twitter handle for the conference. Yes. I apologize, way too yeah. much going on, right? So, because <laughs> uh, I sure was supposed to, you have, oh, see, yeah. see? Just follow us, just follow us. How about that? So you yeah. can follow, follow them explicitly, or it is literally, um, you can follow at CBCF ALC13. Okay, so if you follow that, you'll be able to get all the tweets that way, too. There's also a hashtag, it starts with you, which is literally, of course, the theme of the conference. Thank you. Dr. Flowers. Okay, I do not have a PowerPoint for you. I want to talk with you. I want to first say thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come and learn and to also have an opportunity to share your thoughts and your needs and um, what, what your interests are in STEM. In the chairs, there are some information brochures and there's a handout about C-STEM. I wanna start by giving you a little story about my personal journey. So I'm very passionate about this work in STEM education and in part because I represent the children that I work so hard for daily I stand before you as someone who beat the odds. Originally from Detroit, Detroit public school system failed me, failed second grade, made it to fifth grade without knowing my multiplication tables, shipped to Mississippi, showed up without a parent, to an open concept school in rural Mississippi, 
where teachers grabbed a hold of me and said, this girl can learn, she just needs someone to invest in her. So I learned to learn in the fifth grade. I became an honor student in the sixth grade. Hmm. I decided that I was not happy with the stigma of having failed a grade. So in high school, I decided to make up that grade and complete high school in three years. And then I set off on a journey to college right across the street from a high school that I had read about while I was in high school that made Jet Magazine. So I'm a living proof that nothing happens by happenstance. Everything in your life happens for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. You just don't know how, what, when, or why, where it's gonna show up in your life. Well, I ended up attending a university across from this high school, and I ended up getting my, pers my first professional job, and I'd never been in an environment where I was the minority. So here I am in the healthcare industry as a black young woman, in a white environment. I was not prepared for that. So I jumped out of there and I jumped into a classroom which was gonna be temporary. I said, I'll teach for a year. And I began teaching. And at the end of that year, which was a very tough year because all those wonderful things that was promised to me in that interview by that fabulous principal of all the resources and materials and support that I was going to get and the bilingual aid and just all oh, the pie in the sky, I received my key and said, have a fabulous year, you're doing great. And um, it was an awful experience and with my little salary of maybe 25000 I, you know, I was spending more of it on materials for my students than anything else to just get through the process. Well, I was going to quit at the end of that year. I was packing up and I was heading out of there. I have one student, an Hispanic student of all, and I'm in a predominantly black school, so there was probably, we were about 98% African American. A Hispanic student came and said, Miss Flores, last name Flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I tried to learn everything you teach me. And I said, wow. He said, I won't be back next year, but I wanted to say thank you. Oh, I start crying, oh my God, I made a difference in one child out of 160 that I taught, this is great. <laughs> so I decided, I may come back next year. Well, here we are. You know, it's been close to 18 years now that I've been working in education. But in that process, I realized that I couldn't depend on my administrators and my department chair to help me do what I needed to do for my kids. And so I started to go out in the, in the community. I wrote grants, I wasn't trained on any of this. But in writing grants, it afforded me opportunities to go out and experience a world that I was not being exposed to or trained for as a teacher to prepare my children for success. I was really setting them up for failure. I was telling my students that they can go off to Division I universities, major in engineering, and be successful, and that they were the best and the brightest when really they were the bottom of the barrel if they'd gone across the highway to the other school. Our valedictorian would have been number 788 at their school. So it was a reality that I really wasn't ready for. And when I wrote a grant to compete in a, in a national robotics program that many of you may have heard of called First Robotics, we were the only African-American team. And when we walked in with our ghetto fabulous robot <laughs> that we were so proud of, we got our butts whipped and our eyes opened. And our kids were faced with a reality, and so was I as a teacher, that we need to do some things different. And I had a reality that I couldn't share with them, that it was too late for me to really make a difference in their life because they were 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And there was just there's nothing I can really do. But I knew that for the kids coming in behind them, I had to do something different. And so I happened to start and apply to a doctoral program, and I said, I'm going to research this. And so that's where the STEM research began. And I realized in that process that we can focus on STEM all day, but if our kids cannot read and write, they cannot do math and science. So that's why we have the C. Communication is critical. Because what I found is our kids could not articulate what they knew and what they learned. They couldn't do it verbally, they couldn't do it in a written format, and it was crippling them, and it was also inhibiting them from achieving other goals and, and opportunities in their life, because when they walk into the room, they can't speak the language. So they're intimidated, they're not confident. It shuts them down, they bag away, they settle for less. So I started researching, God, I gotta start earlier, so I went to middle school. I said, oh, I gotta start earlier, I went to elementary school. Oh, I gotta start early. So now when I see a pregnant woman, I go to her belly and I say, look. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> you know, I'm into, you know, the neonatal STEM research now. <laughs> 
So the, the, the organization evolved to services because I realized we beat up on our teachers a lot. But just like I was in the building wanting to do and try, there were others in buildings just like me. You know, I laughed when the movie came out, Waiting on Superman. We're not waiting on Superman. Superman is already in the building. The teachers are there. They need support. They need money. They need resources. They need training. They need advocacy. They want to do a good job. They're showing up, not for the pay, for the love of those children. They're very precious gems to those teachers. And so our, our mission with the organization evolved to support services for teachers. We developed pre-K through 12 grade pipelines so that we can keep children connected to STEM learning. We focus on the core content areas, that's English, math, science, social studies. People want to put STEM in science all the time. STEM is a way of life. When you go out here and turn on your car <laughs> or anything you do, you're not using one skill set. You're using multiple skill sets. It's applying content knowledge to solve a problem, to create a solution, to function, to operate in this world. So that's what we decided to focus on. And we connect with those core content areas as well as art, as well as technology. Because there are kids who love math and science, but they have not encountered a teacher that can help them understand how much they love it. So we'll use art, we'll trick them, whatever we have to do to manipulate them to understanding that they do love math and science and it is a way of life. Because in that space, that's where the opportunities lie. And African Americans are not being trained as early as elementary school. They fall so behind that you can't close the gap as they continue to matriculate through. And then they go to college and they major in social work, psychology and communications and all this other lovely stuff and can't find a job. Mm -hmm. And so we're in, a, we're in a situation now where we're in crisis because you've got all these people with college degrees and cannot find a job and they don't understand why the jobs that are available to them is working at Walmart and at the fast food restaurant, but I have a bachelor's degree. And now I've got so much student loan debt that it's more than my salary. How am I to function? So if we don't make it a priority for our kids to do well in STEM and to find their space in STEM, economically, we're not going to change our communities. Economically, we're going to continue to fail as a people. So we're in crisis. This is a sense of urgency. So I share with you an opportunity to join me in this walk. Partner with me in any other STEM program that is happening in your community. There is a place. You can join and sign up today. You can get kids and schools involved today. We can't do the work alone. It's all of you in this audience. It's everyone on the panel joining an advisory committee, getting on a board, being a champion, helping to grow this work and advocate for this work beyond just your children, but the children that are sitting beside your children. Because if we don't take care of those children, those are going to be the children who are going to do us harm one day. Because there's a, there's a disparity right now. And it's, it's only widening. So we have an app. <laughs> We're on Twitter, Facebook. Our app is CSTEM Challenge. Our programs are openly enrolled now. They operate from the start of the school year to the end of the school year. We have impacted thousands. But just to reach the numbers that we need in these spaces of STEM, we've got to reach billions. The work is very, very important. And we need a lot of champions in the community talking this talk. Now, STEM is popular now. You know, when I started, it was hard for me. I would talk to people about STEM, and they'd say, I'm not going to work with you. You're doing stem cell research. <laughs> <laughs> You're cloning children. They wouldn't work with me. They were just putting up the cross when I walked in the room. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm doing. So, but now everyone's doing STEM because that's where the money is. There's a movement. If you're doing anything in education, you now plopping STEM on top of it. Now, it may not be quality, it may be quality. It may be science fair, but you're just calling it STEM because you need some funding. The number of nonprofits has increased, I, I would say, 25% between 2001 2011. That's over $316 billion in that industry. It is big business now, highly competitive, millions of jobs. So the business sector is tuned in. They're participating. They want to know what the ROI is. I didn't know what ROI was. But they want to know about return on investment. We're talking about human beings. Right. And so it's serious. And you've got this large space 
of nonprofits and growing interest in STEM, but the money pot really hasn't changed. And so it's highly competitive. And so you have to know and understand what STEM is, what your goals are, what type of systemic change you're trying to bring about. Not kicking a can a few more miles up the road, you know, giving an antidote, but really bringing about systemic, sustainable change. And so that is what CSTEM is doing, and we're advocating, and we're, we're in the communities. We're in six states. We're in two countries. We will work wherever there are children. We will work with anyone who has a child and is concerned about the future for that child. We are open. So thank you for your time. Look us up on the web. Our information is in the seat. If you have questions at the end, if we're not able to answer those on panel, I'm happy to stay behind and speak with you. You can email me directly at rflowers at cstem.org. It's very, very easy. And uh, I appreciate your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Excellent. Wonderful. Um, I, first of all, I just love the passion in this room. Uh, I just want to say I'm so honored to be in your presence, uh, including the panel as well as the audience. I know we're here for a reason, and that's because we care about our future, you know, our future, our country, and of course, our students, our children. And as director of Project Lead the Way for Virginia and DC, I'm just so happy to be presenting to you. I'm going to show you a video about who we are as an organization, and then I'll tell you my own little personal story uh, as a kid from New York. Uh, who is here to you know bring bring it forward, pay it forward to the community, and how to and how I represent Project Lead the Way. Tell us why Project Lead the Way has invested in this approach and what are the benefits of this approach over other traditional learning methods. It inspires students, it engages them in ways that um, traditional learning doesn't. The Project Lead the Way team has really shown that this is that final connection in this journey of elementary school kids young, get them engaged, get them inquisitive, whether they're boys, girls, whatever it is, and then have them go through the journey I see people like Project Lead the Way and very important and instrumental in building the pipeline for us. We looked uh, externally to try to find the best partner out there uh, to help us to make a positive impact. We discovered Project Lead the Way. It's been a great relationship for us. We've been very, very impressed by both the quality of, of the materials and the training that they were able to provide. So we made a big investment. It's $2.1 million over a three-year period, and we're sponsoring ultimately over 100 high schools. successful is the implementation of Project Lead the Way in the engineering curriculum and the biomedical. But in this program, students actually apply math and science. All of the Project Lead the Way courses that I've taken have been my favorite courses by far. Like, I look forward to going to those classes. I get very excited by the way in which Project Lead the Way carries out its work. Kids turn off to math and science at an early age. PLTW is really doing something about this problem. So that is our video uh, for Project Lead the Way. I can tell you, uh, 
I've been director for Virginia and DC since January, and it's been an amazing experience. Uh, with schools that started just two weeks ago. I've been inundated with so many meetings and calls uh, with superintendents and CT directors and teachers and educators, as well as parents. Uh, I, my name is Carla. I am the director for Virginia and DC, as I stated earlier, and I am calling to all of you uh, to help our organization, help our students. I have been just blessed to be walking in, uh, into the schools. We are a national organization based out of Indianapolis. We have a national reach, and I can tell you whether it's schools in Jersey or schools in uh, Connecticut or even in the region in DC, uh, I've been amazed by the, the passion of our teachers, but more importantly about the students and the education that they are getting that they deserve. I'll tell you a, a few facts. Um, I'm gonna pull my, my presentation here. Um, so I'll, I'm trying to pull this information. Bear with me, please. Um, okay. I need help. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. So let me. I'm more familiar with the Mac, so I do apologize. Where is my PowerPoint? Oh, here it is. Okay. So here is our organization. Uh, like I said, we are based in Indianapolis. We have a national outreach. Uh, over the summer, we just finished summer training to teachers nationwide. We are an organization that is pretty much, can be our success can be described into three basic pillars. We are divided into our world-class curriculum. Our second pillar is our professional development. Our third pillar is our engaged network. Uh, as director for this area, my job has been working with STEM educators, leaders, uh, industry professionals, as well as the superintendents and CT directors for the DC area and Virginia. It's been an amazing ride. Uh, we, I just added 15 schools since I've started, and it's growing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about our, our curriculum. Our world-class curriculum has been designed by industry professionals, professors, and teachers alike. And they decided that we have to really prepare our country for the global global economy. As uh, previously on the panel, we discussed how we rank 17th, we rank in the world 17th in math, 26th in science. That is a problem. Here in this area, for example, we are expecting about 400,000 STEM jobs by 2018. 1.8 million jobs in the country. And we can all agree on, we do not have the workforce the capacity to fill those jobs, which that brings us to a conversation that we need to take action. We need to be bold, uh, and it doesn't just take you know uh, pr you know it takes really a village of folks, parents, teachers alike, industry leaders to really collaborate together and really energize the base. It's amazing to see that when we collaborate together and we break those silos. We are putting students first. We are putting the best interest of our children. And that way, like what um, one of the, when the professor from North Carolina, I forgot your name, so sorry. Uh, she did an excellent point. This is about a campaign. It's a call to action. It's really understanding the students at their level, getting them engaged, and to really focus on what's important. And that is, of course, with the STEM jobs. So um, our second pillar. Well, going back to the first pillar, which is our world-class curriculum, we are broken down into two areas. Our two areas are engineering and biomedical sciences, and both programs of study, they actually uh, target the middle school and the high school students. And starting next year, we are launching our K through five elementary. Uh, the, just a few uh, fun facts for you. Our national high school of the, our national teacher of the year, and our national high school of the year uh, principal happen to be Project Lead the Way educators. So that's just one of the most amazing facts that we are uh, we are proud to say. Also, two of my schools in Virginia, they came close this past May at the Vex Robotics Global Competition. So these are students that are not just competing with children in our country, they're competing with other students around the world. Another thing to also uh, mention is that our curriculum is 
very robust, it's rigorous, it's uh, very challenging. It opens up to the top 80% of the classroom. When I talk to educators, sometimes they're a little bit concerned about math and science. Oh, it might be a little bit too tough. Well, we at Project Lead, the way our program, it's designed for the top 80%. And we do very well among minority students, uh, high, teetering high school dropouts, uh, you know, communities in the rural, suburban, and as well as urban communities. We do significantly well. One thing to also know is that, from my experience, the math and science skills, the hard skills, we see an increase in the math and science. Uh, at, you know, when our students, when our school subscribes to Project Lead the Way, we have seen an increase in their scores. But interestingly enough, going back to Dr. Flowers mentioned, it's the literacy scores. The literacy scores surpass the math and science. Why? Because our students from the middle school and on up, they are doing PowerPoint presentations, oral presentations, theses, summaries, outlines, etc. So when you go to a class or sometimes you go to an open house where you see a student who is doing a presentation among adults in engineering and biomedical sciences and you see a 12 year old who can articulate the math and science but in, in addition to that the, the passion that this 12 year old exemplifies in this subject matter which is so complex and for me the biggest takeaway is the confidence and the self-esteem that you see these children exemplify for me it takes them a lot lot not longer in life both in a professional and in a you know in an academic sense and it's absolutely amazing so that is our, our first pillar in a nutshell, our professional development. The reason why we have our 98% graduation rate in high school students, it's because our teachers are excellent. They go through rigorous training over the summer at, at our, one of our many uh, university partners nationwide. So they, we have readiness training, we have the core training that we provide, and as well as the ongoing training afterwards. So the professional development from where I visited my schools over the summer, uh, at University of Maryland is one of our partners, in addition to Old Dominion in Virginia. We have, uh, I'm trying to get Howard as a partner as well. And we're nationwide, and the teachers' feedback, when I went to Stevenson in Maryland for the biomedical program, they pretty much said it was boot camp. And I can see that, but they said it was worth it because even as professionals in those fields, when they went to the training, they were just amazed the, how the whole professional development piece really was going to elevate their teaching come fall. So it's that kind of uh, energy and passion and commitment that a teacher has to go through to teach that course in the fall. And our last portion of our success is our engaged network. As you can probably see from the video, we have uh, partners from the industries nationwide. Uh, we have uh, a very engaged network. We have different portals where any school that subscribes to our program has instant access. The teacher, the principal, the administrator, the superintendent, where they have access to our network, they can engage with other Project Lead the Way teachers, which is a great selling point for many teachers who are new into the system. They can go in there and, and just uh, share notes and outlines, tips, guidelines. So for new teachers, they're never alone in the process. So that pretty much encompasses our three pillars of our success uh, as you know in Project Lead the Way. Uh, yeah, I, see, I like these lovely ladies and gentlemen out here. We, I am committed uh, as a kid from New York. I'm a Bronx kid who, uh, similar to uh, one of our panelists that mentioned, I had a lot of obstacles to face. And I stand here before you with a passion to pay it forward and give back to my community. I'm an Hispanic strategist. I'm also a minority outreach strategist uh, in addition to Project Lead the Way. I work very heavily with the Hispanic community and the African American community. I'm trying to build a bridge our communities are facing a lot of the same issues. And I am begging, I am pleading that we need to come together. It is for the future of our children. It's just more than education. It's really like the workforce development, but it's also that community that we're united, that we're built on strength, and that we can provide something, a better, a, what is our legacy is what I'm trying to really focus on. And uh, I, I look forward to, you know, if anyone has any questions or any comments or wants to work with me, I look at me as a partner and a friend and an ally in this because we're in this together. Thank you. So, do you have a PowerPoint? Do you have a can I ask that somebody can turn those lights on? The, the kindergarten teacher in me has been fighting this all panel. Um, it was the lights, and then I was going to ask everybody to move up, but I will resist the second urge. On. 
And if it's okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna keep my seat. Um, so let me first um, say uh, thank you. I bring you greetings on behalf of thank you, brother, uh, President Barack Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, and Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan. That's my frat brother in the back. I appreciate you. Um, I know, sir. Not I saw the Alpha hat. He's a gentleman of Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> Uh, I look, I'm going to respect you, brother, because we just met. Um, so a couple of things. I have the great uh, distinction and honor of serving as the first ever director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans, um, established by our president. Thank you, thank you. Um, if anyone questions our president's commitment to education, just cite the executive order. Um, I'm also very honored to be here because I'm a former CBCF fellow, so I'm especially uh, proud of Jillian. Um, I started on my career on the Hill working for Congressman Rangel, um, and just want to offer that for folks who are wondering um, why you should continue to support this, and two, want to just acknowledge the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, so in the time that I have, I want to just give an overview of some of the ways that the President has been helping to support this conversation. Um, and in doing so, I'll also talk about some of the priorities of the initiative, um, but because I will have to run, I'm going to leave documents here. Um, everyone on social media, you can follow me at Mr. David Johns, or you can follow the initiative at F-A-F-A-M-A-M Education, or I can Google any of this. It's all very public. Hello, young lady. Um, actually, let me do this. So I have a couple of colleagues from the administration. Can I ask you to stand? Young, uh, I see Karen. Um, okay, so if anybody has questions that I can't answer, see this young lady here. Um, are there any parents in the room, parents or teachers? Awesome. Round of applause for each of you. Um, and people who work in technology, I just want to get a sense of who's in the room, people who work in technology. Okay, and, and then just concerned citizens. How many people are in the wrong place that you were too embarrassed to get out? Okay. <laughs> So, um, the president said a while ago, if, you wanna, if we want America to lead in the 21st century, there's nothing more important than giving everyone the best education possible from the day they start preschool to the day they start their education. And one friendly amendment to the president's remarks, um, and this is in light of something Reagan said earlier, learning starts at birth, and the preparation for learning starts well before birth. So, um, so preschool is even too late. Um, so um, put that out there. So a couple of ways in which the, the president is supporting this. So one is training educators, right? We talked about the importance of connectivity. We talked um, implicitly about the role that educators play. So we have a, a, a goal of recruiting 10,000 STEM educators over the next decade. And for us at the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence, we have a particular interest in ensuring that there is diversity within that cohort. So people that look like me, because 2%, uh, fewer than 2% of the workforce actually looks like me, um, especially when you consider men who teach elementary school as I did, um, as well as women. Um, so this is actually an anomaly. I'm honored to be among such beautiful and intelligent women, but typically you don't find this sort of gender representation when we have these conversations. So, so that's our first um, effort is recruiting STEM educators so that they can help do the job of helping students um, leverage technology to demonstrate their, their um, capacity. The second thing is leveraging technology to to improve learning and development. So this is really critical in a couple of areas. Uh, before coming here today, I was at the White House with a group of, of high school students from Los Angeles, California, which is where I'm from. Um, there were students from um, Dorsey High School and Crenshaw High School, um, two of the only primarily African-American high schools remaining in Los Angeles, California. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm gonna try not to cry, but I, I met a young brother today named Dominic who talked about the role of technology in helping him overcome every obstacle. This is a young brother who was placed in special education classes and talked about what it meant to be in a space where if you didn't ask him and he didn't tell you, you wouldn't have known that he was in special education, right? Because he had the ability to leverage resources to demonstrate his understanding and capacity. And what he talked about is that typically when I'm in a classroom, right, we were, he was with a special program where he had relationships with individuals like yourself, and Ray, I thought about you the entire time. Um, but the brother was sitting there talking about, you know, sometimes if you don't ask me, I'm just gonna sit in the class and look at you. I, I just don't get it, I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel like you even wanna teach me. But if you give me something that I can manipulate, just let me go to work, right? And what I kept thinking about was don't believe me, just watch me, right? <laughs> and how it is that we have a responsibility to leverage technology to help all of our kids learn, right? In new, innovative, exciting ways. And the first piece about this is that we can find ways to engage them in ways that we haven't before. The second piece, and I'm just gonna mention, Connect Ed. So this is something that the president talked about not too long ago. This is a, um, an initiative designed to ensure that 99% of students um, throughout this country have access to broadband connectivity. It doesn't make sense to have the device if you can't access anything on it. Right, and so ensuring that we can access broadband connectivity will also help us reach hard to reach populations like individuals who are incarcerated, 
a significant number of low-income black and brown people, and increasingly at alarming rates that black and Latino women are going to jail. So we have an obligation and a responsibility to find ways to leverage technology and STEAM. Um, I know Dr. Holden adds an M for medicine. I add an A for arts. Um, STEAM um, has to be included in how it is that we think about reaching students in all settings, but in particular in those hard to reach settings. Um, the third thing, and I mentioned this, is exposing our community, in particular African American communities, to STEAM early and often, right? And so for me, the critical piece is parents. I said to these students today, imagine if, just close your eyes and think about it, imagine if our community got as excited about a Mensa competition or a robotics competition or a debate as they did about a football game. What would that do for our kids and their self-esteem and their ability to see themselves as STEM professionals? Right, so if we can reach the parents and we can help them become more comfortable with it, right? Look, I get it. My mother is now on the Facebook. <laughs> it took her a long time to get on the Facebook and I'm now resisting her desire to get on Twitter. Right, but her ability to become comfortable with it and facile with it enables her to help support my nine-year-old niece who can do more than she can with the phone. Right, so we have to have a conversation with our community at every level, everybody gotta teach somebody, mm -hmm. right, about how it is that we can support our students. And then this last piece is really critically important. It's reframing the narrative, right? And so you'll see um, um, the initiative has um, several priorities. I've mentioned all of them with the exception of literacy. And I mean the literacy with a capital M. Um, technology literacy, health literacy, financial literacy. We just aren't as literate as we need to be. And I'm talking about our babies as well as our adults. I was in Hampton, Virginia, Virginia with the minister who said that his fear every day is his son who works in a hospital may kill himself because he cannot read the labels on a bottle. And when I asked him how many times did he talked about it in the pulpit, he said to me, none. We got to get past being embarrassed and not wanting to do things that are uncomfortable. And technology is a big part of that as well. So we have an obligation to talk differently about STEM. It should not be the case that our kids only think that their way to become a millionaire is drugs, sports, and entertainment. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility. We can run the numbers. We have a responsibility to talk to them about all of these opportunities that exist in this field that exists now and that will exist for years to come. And then the, 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 the last thing is simply this. Most of the time, we just have to get out of the way. I watch it happen. I taught kindergarten, right? My, my kids could do PowerPoints in kindergarten that kids I teach at, I'm not gonna name the institution, just look it up. <laughs> they can do more than my college students could. They just need somebody to help them connect the dots. And we use it. Parents have devices. I know folks that will spend money on a piece of technology before they will invest in, in their own personal future. And if we as a community don't talk about how we leverage those investments, how we right some of these wrongs, how we get in front of people and take advantage of these tools, then we should just give all this up. Um, so I, again, I'm gonna apologize because I'm gonna have to leave a little bit early, but if you need to reach me, just tweet me. Have a good day. <laughs> Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Last but not least, I hope. Uh, my name is Paulette Lewis, and I'm Regional Administrator of the Women's Bureau with the U.S. Department of Labor, currently um, overseeing our programs and initiatives and policies in Region 4, which is the eight southeastern states, and Region 6, which uh, are the five um, southwestern states, so I have 13 states that I'm working in right now. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Women's Bureau, which was started in 1920, two months before women even got the right to vote. And over these many years, we have been working in many areas that focus on the economic security of women, trying to get better jobs, better working conditions, and better salaries for women. We worked on issues such as family medical leave, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, equal pay and pregnancy leave, and continue to work on issues that impact uh, women. We are currently focused on four issues. The reintegration of women veterans into the workforce, which is a very, very serious issue that I wish I could talk with you more about, but that's not the top topic of the day. Equal pay, which continues to be important because women make 80 cents for every dollar earned by a man. Uh, African-American women make 70 cents, and Latinas make 60 cents for every dollar earned by a man. So this is a very serious issue. Uh, the 
third issue is workplace flexibility. And the fourth issue is green, non-traditional, and STEM jobs. The reason we are focusing on those areas is that women who have STEM careers and STEM occupations and STEM businesses make 98 cents for every dollar earned by a man. So all of these issues in one way or the other are focused on the economic security of women. Over the past eight years, the Women's Bureau has focused on STEM and uh, about four years ago, we uh, published a uh, uh, guide called Why Green is Your Color? A Woman's Guide to a Sustainable Career. And we have been working with work, the workforce systems, teachers around the country, counselors, and educators at all level to help them encourage women and girls to go into STEM occupations. The guide uh, that we have produced talks about how to get training and certificates in STEM occupations. It focuses on the 12 key industries. It um, gives you information on careers in STEM versus other careers. Teachers, for instance, make $11.98 an hour, and carpenters and non-traditional jobs make $18 an hour. Uh, we talk about entrepreneurship um, and financial options and other resources that will help you to get into green and non-traditional and STEM careers, no matter where you are. Uh, the good thing about green green careers and green jobs is most of us can start where we are, and you'll get a better feel for that uh, after you look at our guide. Um, we've also, over the past few years, have had roundtables in many of the major cities around the country, and we bring together citizens like you, uh, women leaders, workforce system, career counselors, educators, to just talk about uh, the resources in their community, and what we found as we have realized today is the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. There are a lot of resources out there. We don't talk about it. We don't connect the dots, and we don't share the information as well and as effectively as we need to. So these roundtables helped leaders in one community to, to find out about the training opportunities, the career and job opportunities, and the resources available in their community. In addition, the Women's Bureau had pilot projects to help women get into uh, green and non-traditional jobs in each of our 10 regions. Um, and we took this, we did this just before the economic downturn, actually in the middle of it. And we took unemployed women in the workforce system, people who were going to the unemployment office, as you know it probably, um, and we helped them to get into green jobs and occupations. I did something a little different in Atlanta. We took 20 women from the workforce system who were looking for jobs, and we worked with them over a 10-month period to train them to become green entrepreneurs. At the end of that 10-month period, 17 of the women uh, actually finished the training, and three were actually generating cash. One woman is a tremendous success story. She was a realtor, and of course, the a real estate market uh, downturn. She had always been interested in nature, so she combined those two interests and uh, started consulting contractors on how to do green building. And so now she now certifies uh, contractors to do green buildings. She's developed a curriculum, and she uh, sold it to the junior colleges, and she actually teaches green construction in the junior colleges. So we taught these women to become uh, entrepreneurs. One of the women does green painting, makes sure that, that paint in the, uh, in the area is non-toxic. So there were a lot of green careers there. Uh, I also did something in Atlanta. We had a STEM summit. We took 200 girls from Girl Scouts, Girls Inc., uh, Cool Girls at the YWCA, and we brought them to a summit on the campus of Georgia Tech. Uh, 60 of the girls were high school girls, but most of them were middle school girls, and we uh, provided for them 14 workshops in STEM areas. Forensics, robotics, genetics, food science, electricity, hydraulics, and all of these classes or workshops were hands-on, they weren't tinkator kind of things, uh, and they were taught by women. And that's very infor uh, important, as Dr. Flowers mentioned earlier, you cannot be what you have not seen. 
I was a, a poor black Catholic girl who grew up in Mississippi in the 1960s. And like Dr. Flowers, I was grabbed by a teacher and taught, and, and a teacher took interest in me. And um, math and science and uh, chemistry were my best subjects. And my teacher fought to get me into a citywide science fair in Mobile, Alabama. And uh, these people had a federal grant, but they weren't allowing black children in the 60s to enter into the citywide science fair. Well, she informed them that she realized it was a federal grant and that she would let them know that they were not allowing all children to get enter. We entered the science fair, and I won sick, second place uh, second place doing the DNA stru structure for the um, pigment in the eyes of a fruit fly. Mm. <laughs> and, and that was 1960. Now the disconnect is even though my teacher did everything she could do to encourage me in science, I had never seen a black female doctor or scientist or science teacher. And so I did not connect the dots. And I ended up being a teacher, which was fine and wonderful. I enjoyed that. But this is why this STEM summit was so important to me and why I was passionate about it. All of these workshops were handled by women. And the young girls developed, um, for instance, we had a young woman from Coca-Cola who taught about food science and developing sparkling beverages. And the girls had to develop a sparkling beverage targeted to teen girls. They had to flavor it, and they had to name it. Uh, the, the high school girls were on a different track they, on computer science. They took an idea from concept to market. And the, the idea was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it was amazing at the end of their programming this how many different configurations the peanut butter and jelly sandwich took because of the directions and the programming that the girls did. So they saw for themselves how important the details were and how important th this could be to products on the market. Um, so that was another pilot project that I did. And my whole purpose, again, was to have the girls see people who were actually doing things, who were doing prostheses and, and um, uh, biochemistry and all kinds of, of things. And it was a great success. We brought together uh, elements from people from Spelman, Agnes Scott, which is another girls' college in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, women in technology, women in engineering, Georgia Power. All of these people collaborated to make this happen in Atlanta. Uh, our final, final session was a concurrent session for parents. We have session for parents to talk with them about how to encourage their students. Because as we know, many of us know, girls dumb down about the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, they exceed in everything. But about the fourth grade, they dumb down because first of all, it's not very popular be, to be smart. And secondly, uh, th they become more aware of things called boys. Uh, so we talk with, with parents about how to get their girls over that obstacle as well as ob other obstacles that they would face going into area, areas that are traditionally male dominated. And we talk with them about how to get scholarships, how to get them into internships, and how to overcome all kinds of challenges. Um, another thing in my career that I just want to pull in here, I worked in the 1980s uh, for Procter & Gamble, working with black female engineers. These women were brilliant. Uh, and Procter & Gamble at that time had 90% of all of the black female engineers in the country. These women went there, and after three years, they ended up leaving Procter & Gamble and going into teaching. They felt they were a failure. So we worked with Procter & Gamble. And we talked with, uh, we worked with three levels of management because we refused to go into it treating the women as if they were broke. So we got the management involved in it and we trained them as well. The big issue really was, in many ways, communication, as we heard earlier. Uh, but these women were put into jobs in corners trying to make sure that they didn't fail. They didn't, they didn't fail. But what it did is not allow them to succeed. And so we work with them on career development and work with their managers and, and, and 
When we left, there were women developing the perfume market for all over the world, uh, developing the whole Africa market for Procter & Gamble, and it was a very quick turnaround just p based on communication. Um, I encourage you to go to our website, www.dol gov slash wb. I left some cards out on the table there that will have our website. I also uh, left some posters uh, of women in STEM careers because again you have to see it to understand that you you can be a part of it. So well, um, you're welcome to those posters and you're welcome to uh, the postcards. Also go to the Department of Labor's website, dol.gov. There are a lot of resources on there for STEM occupation. And I have for you today, everyone has a, stop, a copy of our guide. This is our guide. It is a flash drive and it was developed by one of our staff people. So I have one of these for each of you. Thank you. Well, let's give a round for our panel. As you all can see, they are highly knowledgeable, highly knowledgeable about this, and they're all very passionate. And something that I want to ask, I'm going to ask the panel just one question and then open it all up for you. I want to leave about 15, 20 minutes for you all to be able to ask your questions. Something that stayed with me while listening to all of you, and then particularly listening to David Johns, is we talk about we want to create systemic, sustainable change in STEM education for our, for our youth, for our black and Latino youth. Everyone is doing programs and, you know, starting earlier. Where are the parents in this conversation? Because all, as we all know, the parents have to be there. And you can learn it in school. You can go to an after-school program. But if it's not reinforced when you come back home for those other six hours, mm -hmm. students might not stay connected, like you're all saying. So if two or three of you could talk about how to keep um, parents engaged or how to get parents more educated or maybe the local community, because I know some folks raise their hands that they're not parents, but we all know a child. And we all are somebody's godparent or a godfather, and we can all make, be, have an impact on that child. So what can the parents, or at least the local community members, do to help elevate STEM education? Well, I'll go ahead and share uh, what CSTEM is doing to engage parents. We work directly with the schools. We work with the teachers. Uh, we target six teachers per school campus, and with those teachers, we're able to reach those students. How we reach the parents is through our community partnerships. It is very hard to engage parents, particularly once kids finish elementary school. Parents become um, a, a more busy, less engaged, um, not as present at the middle and high school level. So we rely on our relationships with churches, community organizations, um, leveraging our partnerships to help us get the word out. We're on the radio, we're on television, we're wherever we can get information out. If it's partnering with the energy company and when you send out the light bill, <laughs> putting <laughs> something in there, it's all about leveraging um, your relationships and partnerships to get to the parents. Uh, you know, we, we can make a difference with the children a, a lot more easy than we can to, to get to the parents because we're not in the household. We don't necessarily have that direct access to the parents as much as we do the children. But through partnerships, I would say um, that's your best way. Get into the pulpit. Your pastors, you know, they'll let you mm -hmm. come and share. Um, get them involved. Get them on your advisory committees. And then now the pastor's in the pulpit saying, um, we're hosting STEM workshops at our church. We're supporting STEM education. And that helps you um, get the word out. So, so let, me, let me add something to that. I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my perspective um, first as the director of My Health Impact. So all of the students that work with me, they're in college whether they're in graduate school or undergraduate school, I know all the mamas and the daddies. It is not unusual for me to um, pick up the phone and say, I haven't seen so-and-so, or you say you were going out of town and I haven't seen you back on the project. What's going on? So I've met parents, even though I'm a university professor. Now, I'm gonna put on my parent hat um, to answer that. I think. I think a lot of what I hear is that parents don't want to be involved. And, and I don't believe that because I, I actually work, I become, and I tell young people, it is best for you to get all you can while you're young because when your students get older, they need you more. So I have 
a freshman in college and a 10th grader. I probably spend more time at the high schools because they're older and they need me. My husband and I, we partner as a team and we call, we call it our yearly roundup. And we go and see teachers, not when there's a problem. We go and see teachers at the beginning of the year. I think one of the things that, especially in our community that I don't see, and I'm a, what we have in Wake County, you know, we've been a lot in the news, okay, Wake County Public Schools. Um, what we have is something called the Board of Advisory Council. So I am the chair for the Board of Advisory Council, or past chair, just finished this year. Um, as a District 7 representative. So I work directly with the representative from that Board of Education. I don't see us at those meetings. Um, I'm, I've, given, I've been given the opportunity to go out into the community and speak about what does that mean for us to be in those meetings. This is not a PTA meeting. This is a meeting where you actually get to meet principals and administrators and voice your opinions. And our parents, we need to be there. Um, and we've gone to churches, we've gone to community centers, we've gone to WISE, we partnered with different uh, nonprofit organizations in the community. It is so important, but we're not there. I guess I have a different take. Uh, for our college and post back students, uh, the parents just really aren't there or they're not supportive. So for example, we have quite a few students who are in foster care who have gone from home to home, but they know that they want to do something with their life positively. Um, and they found a way to get to college even though their parents may mm -hmm. be uh, incarcerated and not in, in college uh, or even have finished high school or even middle school. Uh, we have students who, uh, Parent, they live with their parents, but their parents aren't supportive of them. One student told me that the only place he could study was in the shower. He would mm. close mm. the bathroom door and he would literally sit in the shower with the water off and that's where he could study. So, you know, the students that we're dealing with on the college level are those who are overcoming these obstacles that day by day someone in a similar situation might just say, you know, hang it up, you know, I'm going to do something sure. else that is going on in my neighborhood. Uh, so we, we try to create that safe space uh, for those students um, so that they can come and, and commune with each other. Uh, we actually have an idea, to, idea in looking at property to start a study hotel where the students can come and stay and study mm -hmm. and uh, be around like-minded uh, individuals and they don't have to be in the areas where they're hearing gunshots and so forth uh, that are distracting them. For our high school and middle school students, uh, we do, in the application process, uh, have at least two, uh, two adults uh, sign it, parent, guardian, or friend, neighbor, et cetera, relative. And um, we have been able to track the students that way, not only through their, their information, but the other uh, subsequent information with uh, the relatives and the parents. The thing that we've started um, this past uh, year is a parent e-newsletter. You know, we realize a lot of parents may not be techn technologically savvy, but between a newsletter, between being in the schools for parent-teacher, tacking on to parent-teacher uh, uh, nights, uh, which are not well attended, uh, and also um, through uh, the churches. We're very active in churches and uh, urban radio. And you capture a lot, especially for our community-based mm -hmm. uh, activities, a lot of people um, hear about it through urban radio. I think we have to help parents get in touch with uh, their children's dreams yes. and, and in touch with their dreams for their children. I think a lot of times as, as parents, we have dreams for our children, but they're very abstract. We, we, we don't think about how, 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 is it, how is this going to happen? And I call it getting it off the paper. And I think, you know, there's a lot we can do in churches. Uh, first of all, we have to increase the communication between parents and children so that uh, parents get in touch with their ch children's dreams, but then help parents to develop a strategic plan. How do we get from where we are to where we want to go? What's go? What is it going to take? Does it mean you need an internship? Does it mean you meet, need classes in uh, public speaking? What little things can we do during these eight years that you're going to be with me learning to 
prepare you and position you better to, to realize your dream. And I think churches can do um, a lot to help parents with this. Again, to get it from the abstract to the concrete. These are some little steps that we can take. And this is what I can do. This is where I can start helping to find internships, uh, uh, mentors, and first of all, taking their children to events. You know, why aren't there a few children here or on the weekend to meet other people, to see role models, to, to understand what people are doing, to tell stories. My husband, for instance, sent out to our grandchildren. There was a young girl in Atlanta, uh, 13 years old, who had been homeschooled. And she uh, has created her own clothesline. She, everything she does is environmental. She doesn't waste anything. She creates something out of every piece of waste that comes through the house. And she's, she's, uh, she's an entrepreneur. <laughs> so he sent this to all of our granddaughters, six of them. And I mean, these kinds of things, we have to tell our stories and we have to expose our children to opportunities. And if you'd raise your hand, I'll come and give you the mic. Can you just say your name and affiliation? My name is Sherelle Dorsey. I work in education and youth policy for the city of Bridgeport. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you all for just providing your comments and your perspective. It's just extremely equipping to have all of you sitting on this panel and giving us um, some insight about what we can do as a community to partner together. Um, Bridgeport, Connecticut is one of the largest cities in Connecticut and the poorest. It is 90% African American and Latino. Um, some of our schools are operating at literally at a 4% literacy rate. So that's the kind of environment we're talking about. So when we're discussing um, parent involvement, our parents are also the result of a failed education system. And so STEM education is not very relevant for them. And so my question is, how do we make it relevant? Um, how do we also uplift and empower them in these fields of, as we talk about green economy jobs and giving them training, whether it's they're coming to the schools on the weekends to study for their GED and improve their literacy skills. Because right now we have language barriers, we have education barriers. There are just a range of social issues um, in our communities and Although we are providing programming for students and like just such as some of the programs that you guys provide, which is great, our parents can only be advocates to a certain extent by saying, you need to go to school, you better get your butt on the school bus because I have to go work three or four jobs right now so I can put food on the table. So it's more than just helping them to realize their dreams if you're trying to keep the lights on. The reality mm -hmm. is, how do we make it relevant, important, and significant? And when the parent can't be there, I myself was raised in a single parent household, my mom, after I I got into AP Cal, she was like, go You're get yourself a tutor, you know, because I can't help you. But she pushed me into certain programs. So that was her being able to guide me through putting me into programs such as the programs that you got, you all have um, and getting that support. But how do we rally support around parents who may not have the time, um, the skills, um, the, the, the interest themselves in order to support their kids? So that was kind of long winded, but hopefully we got, got a question out of there. <laughs> Anybody on the panel want to address that? That's a really great question. I actually been to Bridgeport last year, um, and I am familiar with you know the statistics out there. I think you know if we kind of well, I want to like to, I would like to step away a little bit from education, you know, just for a second. I think deep first and foremost, we're all humans, and I, you know one of the things that I always see in the communities uh, doesn't matter what race background it is, you know, we all have a heart, and I think we, we should start we should start talking about caring putting care in the in the subject when we help our fellow neighbor. Um, you know, I agree with that we should get involved more with churches, our church groups, faith-based groups, uh, communities. It really boils down to the community. If you if you pause for a second, have you do you have a relationship with your neighbor next door? Do you have a relationship with the person when you go grocery shopping? Do you know them by their name? Do you want to get to know them? You know, the, the, the reality is, you know, we are having a huge crisis here in education. We have a crisis in, in jobs and careers. But in order to get to find that solution to that perspective, I think we need to humble ourselves. That's something that I strive for every single day to really connect with people. I've done outreach. I've gone 
I've traveled so much last year uh, when, I, when I worked for a previous organization, and I've navigated both low-income, underserved, high-income, middle-income middle communities. And guess what? The problem is all across the board. We all have an issue. And the question is, are we going to humble ourselves? And I think leaders, no matter what industry or organization, we need to talk less ask more questions and get the community, give them the microphone for a chance and let them dictate the conversation. And I think that approach is going to help our community. Um, I feel that going back to uh, the parents, I think if we created a message of community involvement where, for example, sing single parent homes can't take care of their kids, but guess what? If you have a relationship with the next door neighbor, if you have a relationship with even the post office, the postman, for example, hey, they're keeping an eye out. Hey, sure, I'll be there. So it goes back to building relationships is what I would suggest. And that continuity of care. Absolutely. Okay. Um, my name is David Reddick. I'm on the city council for the city of Anniston, Alabama. And my question is, how can I get this STEM program? And, I'm, and I got here a little bit late. I may have missed it. But how do I get this program implemented in my city and my schools? How can I get this done for my city? Well, you can start with one of us up here on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Our program, there's a brochure in your seat, uh, the C-STEM Challenge. It is a STEM program. It is the first pre-K through 12 STEM program in the nation. Um, it's about teacher development. Um, providing exposure, real-world opportunities for s students to engage in STEM programming from robotics to geoscience, uh, film development, movie um, development, and photography, uh, geoscience, I may have mentioned that. There's a STEM quiz bowl. Uh, it's a, a eight to 10 months, somewhere along the lines, commitment during this academic year. And then there's an international competition at the end of the school year, which happens in Houston um, in partnership with Shell Oil Company. And so that's one way. Um, I'm happy to share and send you information. My email is very easy. It's rflowers at cstem.org. Uh, it's all about getting the information. Even if you can't do anything now, you start the work now with engaging um, your community, sharing information, and, and seeing um, where, where can it fit. You know, maybe CSTEM might not be for your community. Maybe it is Project Lead the Way. But you've got to find out how do you leverage what's out here with the resources that you have, with the programs that are out here to really help you um, meet your end goal and, and your, your targeted objectives to really bring about some systemic change. What I'm seeing um, far too often is there are a lot of STEM programs that are coming in and out of schools. It's here mm -hmm. today, it's gone tomorrow mm -hmm. because there's no um, true leveraging, or collaborating, partnering, leveraging of resources so that you can keep the programs in the communities for the children, for the teachers. So I'm happy to um, advise you and support you through that process however I can and anyone else in here who's interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the important things about that is what I see is you mentioned during your presentation that there are a lot of STEM initiatives. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of STEM initiatives because there's money out there. Mm -hmm. And not everyone has a, very, a passion for sustaining the programs. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the passion is about getting the grant mm -hmm. and it's not about the community. Mm -hmm. So I think you really want to look at what's best for your community and what can be sustained because it confuses the young people. Yeah. I would say just to add, um, to see what is in your backyard. Uh, we've gone in uh, through mentoring and medicine, and we've had key stakeholders at the table, mm -hmm. and they didn't even know they were two blocks from each other <laughs> doing a similar program, yeah. and were upset about it. Uh, so we, we see one of our roles as, as bringing the community together to see what do you have, and then having focus groups to see, well, how can a mentoring in medicine augment what you already have or do not have? So as the other uh, panelists, I would be also happy to speak with you, but I would say the first thing you should do is see what do you have that you may not know about, which may take you know, a little bit of research, but you, you may be surprised. I think if you bring together the leaders, as we did in our roundtables, just leaders from the community to just have a dialogue yes. about resources, employers, educators, counselors, uh, politicians, mm -hmm. women's yeah. leaders, parents, to talk about what they know. Mm -hmm. and, and what's available in the area, just c connecting the dots of the resources there. And then you can see uh, what you have, discover what you need, and put together a program that's specific for your community. 
I think also what's important in that, because um, the question came up about parents and parents being involved. You know, the language of STEM is, is, is really a language. And, and not understanding what STEM is, and you often hear people say it's hard. It's hard, or that's where the geeks are, or that's where the white guys are. And so changing that, that jargon, so you've got to break it down. That's why I always tell the young people, okay, you have Java skills. Java was hard, whatever that means. But what can you do to enable a message? How can you put that into some applicable way that will have some impact? And, and making sure that parents in particular understand what STEM really is um, and, and, and stay away from hard. Most things in life are hard. Mm -hmm. But you, but you know, you gotta tell them, they got, the children will have to put the work in. Mm -hmm. And green and STEM really are about innovation. Mm -hmm. All of us have that. All of us have uh, the, the unique ability to create. And it's being done with and without degrees. And children are coming up, there was a 14-year-old girl, I mean a 17-year-old girl in Florida who sat in her room with her computer and devised a test to detect breast cancer early, 17 years mm -hmm. old. She's going to Duke next year, mm -hmm. 17 years old. So all of us have this ability and we need to get in touch with it. You don't, you know, a degree is great, but it's not always necessary, it's about innovation and creativity and all of us have our ideas and that's the one thing in this whole thing that levels the playing field. Because nobody can take that away from us. The ability to innovate, to come up with an idea and to, maybe we can't implement it so that's where the rest of us comes in, that's where the village comes in. But all of us have ideas and we just have to open it up again. And just based on time, I know there's multiple questions out there. We're gonna take one question and then we wanna hear back from the panelists about giving you all one nugget to leave with um, and then maybe one other opportunity or way that you can engage with your community um, around some education or your youth. But like they all had, they had Twitters, they had emails, T-shirts, <laughs> they are accessible. Um, so this will be the last question. Thank you. My name is Will Hardy. I'm from Portland, Oregon, 3,000 miles from here. It's good to be here. I'm a, a board member of the African American Chamber of Commerce. I'm also a father and a mother. In the county where we're at, there's 790,000 white people, mm -hmm. about 30,000 blacks, which is like 5% in the county. Mm -hmm. We are less than 2% of Oregon's residents. For us to find a good education system, we had to put our kids in a private school, which is predominantly European. Mm -hmm. When my son went to robotics, he was discriminated against, and I'm putting that mildly, mm -hmm. until he showed how well he could play basketball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then he had friends and people who surrounded themselves. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to find a place where our children can grow and not only see no, what Europeans can contribute to success, but to see brown, black faces yes. mm -hmm. where they can connect. Mm -hmm. When you talked about uh, social media, is there a social media way of our children in Oregon connecting with these children you're making mention of so that they can mentor, partner, share, and as oh, iron sharpens iron, begin to sharpen each other on a national level? Yes. Can I, can I just comment? And I know you have a, a, a lot to say about that. So we encountered that problem pretty much across the country. So we've started virtual programming, mm -hmm. uh, and it's an e, uh, synchronous e-learning platform where students from wherever they are actually are in the classroom, in a sense, because they are chatting to us. A lot of them are Skyping in, mm -hmm. uh, but they're learning the information that the other students are learning. They have exposure to the health professionals. They're listening to their stories. Uh, they're doing projects. We're playing their projects through technology. So, you know, there's so many different ways to engage students who may be in areas 
where where you don't have the resources that are just great. So I commend you for coming, first of all, and I commend you for, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't even imagine what your, your, you and your, your family's been through, but, but just be encouraged to know that there are ways to connect your, your children and those like your children to, you know, a New York City or in Atlanta or other places where, you know, they, they would be encouraged and, and feel safe to grow. So, so, may, may I? Okay. So I can tell you that, um, A, as a parent, what you experience does not surprise me because I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share, I mean, I, I hope a tear doesn't drop, but I can tell you what my son told me last year, well, last May, while walking through a mall. He said to me, he said, Mom, he said, in my AP Cal class, no one asked me a question about math, but they'll ask me about the next rap song release. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't imagine how I felt. Well, you can. <laughs> and he's in a community where there is larger representation of people that look like him. It goes back to he's in the community where there are more people that look like him in the school, but in the classroom at that level, at AP Calc, how many black boys were in the classroom? How many black children had the AP Calc teacher encounter? Oh, I was livid, okay? Now, I can tell you what I've done with my health impact is that the young people that are developing all of the technology and innovating, I'm encouraging them to become innovative entrepreneurs. Secondly, I've taken that cohort of students and I've worked with the city of Raleigh on a, on a high school program where my scholars actually pair up with high school students and they mentor them virtually. They hold sessions, they talk about careers, we have um, an outline of what they're to discuss in terms of curriculum, but the goal is so that the high school student can see the college student matriculate and matriculate successfully. So we can talk, but I, I, I understand exactly how you felt. And if I can also offer to you, a, a lot of programs are virtual now. Everything mm -hmm. that we do, we're in six states and two other countries. There's no way we can be in all those places. So everything is virtual. Yeah. We have our own social network like a Facebook. It's called Seaston Break. And our kids are on there engaging from as young as second grade up and through college. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate to have been in this long enough to where we have kids who are actually working in STEM industries with their STEM degrees in college. We have lots of great alumni. But uh, So I ask that you, if you're interested, I'd love to share and connect you there. Also, I like to, to say that you don't have to hear from me. We're fortunate today to have a C-STEM teacher here in the audience. This is Zena Whitworth here. She is our STEM Teacher of the Year from 2012, 13. She's here from Prince George's County. Um, and believe it or not, um, she's an English teacher. So who would have thought an English teacher would be transforming STEM education? She's leading this work in Prince George's County with the elementary, middle, and the high school. And I was very excited this year for her to share with me that those little elementary kids have um, been in the program six years now, I believe, and they're now freshmen at the high school. So you're talking about building a pipeline that she has walking into her building. But CSTEM, we're proud. Over 98% of our students are minority. So I understand, and that's why our work is so important. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of that, where your son has ex had this experience, for us as a nonprofit that has over 98% minority, what we find is that you have Caucasians who will say our program is not rigorous and challenging enough because we don't have enough of them in the program. So mm -hmm. we've got to get out here and support, and mm -hmm. we've got to get out here and champion because mm -hmm. it is rigorous, it is challenging, mm -hmm. and I guarantee, um, mm -hmm. you know, that what they sign up for, it, it would stretch them beyond anything that they've been prepared for in, in any classroom. Mm -hmm. okay. To answer your question, sir, we will be having an alumni, uh, student alumni uh, group on the Project Lead the Way. So all the incoming students, whether, well, as of next year, it'll be K through five, but the current middle school and high school students in the system, if they want to connect uh, with former Project Lead the Way alumni, they can. That will be coming up soon on our site. I think part of, if I can say something in closing, I think part of the issue is expectations. You know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, what parents did and what parents can do and, you know, 
I'm, I'm the product of a 16 and a 17 year old at the height of the civil rights movement. Clearly could not help me with AP calculus. Clearly could not help me with honors chemistry. But the expectation in the house was that you will get this mm -hmm. yeah. without tutors. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> you will get this. And so I think those expectations sometimes are even communicated to majority white high school students as to what they expect in the STEM classroom, not even just from a teacher, but from their classmates. And so I think expectations plays a big part in this. Mm -hmm. And if each person could share their nugget of information or... That was mine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One lasting thought that you would like to leave the audience with. Did I put you on the spot? You did, you did, you did. My, my last nugget would be help us make STEM learning for African Americans yeah. the, the message of the day. Yeah. If, if you can help make it the charge, the message of the day, the advocates will come, the support will come. When you mm -hmm. look at something like gay marriage now, it's been passed and legal and supported by Democrats and Republicans. If we can create a message as strong as that yes. for STEM, for African American students on how they need to learn, what they need to learn, um, we would get the systemic change we want to see and we wouldn't have to go out here and look for advocates. The advocates will be coming to us to help. I guess my nugget would be if we look at all that we've talked about, the communications, the economics, the cultural deficiencies, all these, the, the sociological deficiency, the, um, um, the education, uh, this whole situation can be overwhelming. Uh, but the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. <laughs> Each one can do something. Each one of us can do something. So pick that part of the elephant that you can handle and swallow. So with, in other words, don't just be overwhelmed by the elephant. Do something, pick a part that, that you can make a difference in and go with it. I would like to say, uh, to, to allow children to, to be exposed, to, to allow them to dream, uh, because it's through that dream, even though they may not see someone that looks like them that's doing that, what they may want to do, that the dream becomes a reality. So our tagline, Mentoring in Medicine, is helping turn dreamers into biomedical professionals, and it sticks with people because they know that where we are in some of those communities, these kids are dreamers because no one in the community, no one in the family has, has reached where they want to be. But the key is to support them to create a safe space and mm -hmm. to set the expectation that it is possible. Well, here's the thing. Um, in the years to come, the jobs are coming. That's a reality. And uh, it's a sense of urgency, and it's time to get really bold, take action, be proactive, and find the solution. The jobs are gonna come, and we have a choice. Either we get involved now and prepare our students, all children in this country, for these jobs, or we will have to suffer the consequence and seeing those jobs go overseas. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. We'll give the other on the panel a round of applause. Thank you everyone for, for giving your time and for the work that you all do. And I would just say to remain hopeful because I think sometimes we can lose that faith and that hope that people don't care. There's a room here of folks that care, who are committed. Mm -hmm. If it's not for their child, it's for another child. So to continue to reach out and to be that connection and to have that continuity of care um, because our youth are our future and we want to make sure that we prepare them adequately. Thank you very much. And I'm sure the panel will be more than delighted to take questions, but they're going to take a picture first. So if you don't mind just waiting for the photo op, and then you can rush. Thank you so much. Can we please get a round of applause again for our panel and for our moderator? And I ask you all for a big favor, please. As you leave, we have some sign-up sheets. If you could please leave us with your contact information, one in part so that if there's any other work around this issue, we can share information with you about it. Secondly, we do have an evaluation that we're going to send to you. We really would like to get your feedback on the session. So please make sure you leave your contact information with us. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.